Before reading the scripture this morning, I want to just lift up a, a few things in the life of our community that are kind of important. Uh, Francisco Barrera, who's sitting right there, raise your hand. Um, been worshiping, baptized, I don't know, five, six months ago, and been part of the church. Um, will be deployed to Egypt in a few weeks, and so wanting to keep him in our thoughts and prayers as uh, he'll be gone from uh, this community for a while, but uh, thinking about him. Also want to lift up uh, uh, Joseph Kano, who, if you were on Facebook uh, uh, recently and saw uh, my image, uh, Joseph has been away from us here at Cypress Creek for about nine months. Prior to that, he was uh, finishing up a second tour in Afghanistan, but uh, left the military and went to the academy to become a state trooper. And he graduated on Friday, and I was able to be in Austin for that graduation, which was really neat. The third thing I want to lift up uh, is Chelsea Martin. Uh, down here on the front row, one of our youth, uh, Chelsea, uh, was invited after applying to be a part of the General Youth Co uh, Commission, which uh, we have an area youth commission, we have a regional youth commission, and then there are about a dozen youth from across the United States, Canada, and Puerto Rico that are invited to be a part of the General Youth Commission, and Chelsea uh, applied and made it. And so an exciting thing for our congregation and for her. Just some really important things in the life of our community of faith that I wanted to uh, lift up to you. And then also just making note in your bulletins this morning, there was the envelope for the special Christmas offering, an important part of our tradition and denomination, so I hope you'll consider being generous to that. This morning we look at Matthew, very first chapter, familiar words for this season. It says this, now, the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child of the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took, to, took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from his sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord had commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had borne a son, and he called his name Jesus. May our God richly bless these words of Scripture. That portion of Scripture is a story, a story like many stories, a story with a moment of conflict, of uncertainty, and even the possibility of failure. But then a message, a message that invites one to be faithful in the midst of what had to have been a very dark time. And suddenly, where we had originally seen a defeat, disappointment, God brings forth God's vision, a vision of love and reconciliation. Today, we light the fourth candle in this Advent season, a candle of love, to signify the power of God's love to enter our stories, even when those stories appear to be leading to failure. This light of love brings forth for us God's vision, a vision that is for you, for me, and for all the world. I invite you now to join in song as we prepare to light this fourth candle. Oh 
This morning you are invited to come home for Christmas. Let us celebrate the invitation we have received. In this experience of welcome, we learn of God's far-reaching love. A love born among the weak and forgotten of the world. In this fourth week of Advent, we join sisters and brothers around the world to both receive and share this gift. May this fourth candle of the Advent season signify the light of love entering our world, revealing how we are to love. You join me in prayer. Giver of every good gift this season, we pause, we acknowledge, we give thanks, and we prepare to receive, to receive all your good gifts, including hope, peace, joy, and now love. Oh Lord, you are Emmanuel the one who has come to us to be with us to show us the fullness of each of these gifts. We ask these words of prayer in the name of Christ Jesus. Amen. When I served the church in Kansas City years ago, uh, occasionally I would have to cross the border. Well, I served on the Kansas City, Missouri side, and I'd have to cross the state line and go over to Kansas City, Kansas. One of our members might be in the hospital or something like that. Well, one of those times, a December day, a cold December day, I needed to go to Trinity Lutheran Hospital. I made the trip over there, went up to the room where I found my member and his wife, we started chatting, and, and then a nurse came and kind of tapped on the door and, and stuck her head in and said, would it be okay if I propped your door open? We have a choir here, and they're going to be singing Christmas carols. Oh, we thought that sounded wonderful. So she propped open the door, and, and then she went to the door across the way and knocked on it and did the same thing, propped it open, and then we saw her scurry down the hallway. A few moments later, we began to hear softly carols. Beautiful music coming from down the hallway. Most of them were traditional carols, but a few of them were more the secular Rudolph and Jingle Bells. But still, all of them were beautiful, done a cappella and often with four part harmonies. Then there was a break from the music. And so I took the opportunity, had a quick word of prayer with the couple said my goodbyes, got up and left. But as I went out into the hallway and turned toward the lobby in the elevator, there ahead of me was the choir. And at first glance, something caught me off guard. There, there were three dogs with the choir. Now, I don't think they had actually been singing. But then on closer look, I noticed that a number of them also had long white canes. The entire choir was made up of individuals who were blind. At that moment, they kind of organized themselves and began singing another carol, Angels We Have Heard on High. And so I just paused by the nurse's station to, to hear that wonderful carol. But then they got to, I think it was the third verse, and they sang, Come to Bethlehem and see. Christ who comes in lowly birth. I mean, it seemed strange to hear this choir sing, Come to Bethlehem and see. And yet they sang it with such passion, such enthusiasm. It was as if they had seen something and they wanted us who were hearing them sing to come and to see what they had seen. 
My question is, how much do we not see because we see? Let me put that a different way. How often do we fail to perceive because we see things all the time? Are we not inundated with Christmas? I mean, going back to like before Halloween, we were inundated with Christmas. It was everywhere we looked. And, and I find myself at times tuning some of that out. And I think there's a danger there. Because all that language, all those images associated with Christmas that we have just being thrown at us, I think we can become a bit immune to it, if you will. I mean, it's a lot like well, when you get a vaccination. What do they put in you? They put in usually a dead version of the virus. And your body reacts to it. And you build up an immunity. And so you won't actually catch the living virus. Well, I think that there is enough of the dead understanding, the empty understanding of Christmas out there coming at us from every different direction that we're becoming immune to the real meaning. We are becoming inoculated, if you will, from the living Christ. I mean, just a couple of examples. I'm flipping through the channels the other day, and I catch the tail end of a commercial. And they say, give the gift of sexy hair this Christmas. Yes, that's exactly what Jesus was thinking. I am certain of it. Or the commercial, and you may have seen this, of a wrestler. It's for a, a big wrestling match. It's going to be televised. And he's dressed up kind of in a Santa outfit. And there's a few others that are dressed up like elves. And he begins to quote scripture by saying, We come bearing good tidings of great joy. Well, that's what the angels said. And then invited people to come and see the Christ child. No, they said, We come bearing good tidings of great joy for a smackdown extraordinaire. Come and see. I don't quite think that's what we have in mind here. I mean, the next thing I expect to see is, you know, the holy family. They're standing in beautiful light. And Mary with the, the baby Jesus in her arms, and she's beginning to wrap him in swaddling clothes. And then on the commercial, you hear this, Arr! and a voice say, them ain't swaddling clothes. Oh, no, those, those clothes, they're swank. They're the new line of children's clothing from Armani. And then you expect to see the little baby Jesus' head pop up and give a thumbs up. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that we see all around us. This understanding of Christmas. And yes, people say we need to put, we need to put Christ back into Christmas. That Jesus is the reason for the season. Yet too often... I think what people want is they want the name. They want just the name for sentimental reasons, for nostalgia. They like hearing that name. But recently I had somebody say, you know, we just need to put Christ back into Christmas. And I said, absolutely. How should we do that? And I got this kind of blank stare. Well, well what we need to do is we, we need to put Jesus back in the manger. Oh. oh, okay. Is that it? Is that all there is? In our scripture this morning, Joseph finds himself in a rather difficult predicament when he discovers that his fiance is pregnant and it's not his. And so he's really troubled on what to do and, well, he has this dream. And a divine messenger appears to Joseph. And in that dream, basically, he hears a voice say, you know, this is important. This is very important, and you are going to be a participant. And what I need you to do, Joseph, is to name this child 
to name this child Jesus. It's a marvelous moment in the Scripture. But that name Jesus, it would have been a common name, like John or or Mary. It is the Greek version of a Hebrew name, Joshua, or what we know as Joshua. Yeah, that's what the name Jesus is. And it's interesting, in Acts chapter 7, verse 45, there's a reference to the Joshua of the Old Testament, and most translations translate it there as Joshua. The King James Version does not. It translates it as Jesus. Why? Because in the Greek, it's the same word, whether it's there in Acts or in the Gospels describing the child that Mary and Joseph have. The name Jesus is the name Joshua. Whether we translate it as Jesus or Joshua, the word has meaning. It's Jehovah saves or Yahweh or the Lord saves. That word saves, though, isn't just rescuing. It means to to heal. It means to restore. Names say something, especially in In biblical times, names meant something, and you needed to pay attention to that. And so when Matthew begins this section of his gospel and says, now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way, we hear the name Jesus, Joshua, Jehovah saves, but then comes Christ. That is not his last name. It wasn't Joseph and Mary Christ and their son Jesus Christ. No, it's Christos in the Greek. It is a title that is given to Jesus that means the anointed one who liberates and delivers. You know, I think so often people say what we need to do is we just need to capture, recapture the true meaning of Christmas. But the things of Christmas are not intended to be captured. They are the ways of God, the ways that God's love acts in the world. And we do not capture something like that. We receive it. And then in turn, we share it. The moment we capture it, the moment we attempt to control it, we empty it of its meaning. And it becomes dead. And that which is dead inoculates us from the true meaning. We become immune. We see, but we do not perceive. We hear the words, but we do not know their implications. Jesus, Christ, even the word Christmas. Historically, there were many Protestant traditions early in this country's history, that refused to celebrate Christmas. Among them, our tradition, the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, refused to celebrate Christmas because of its, of its meaning. The Old English was Christ Mass. And some Protestant groups said, well, that sounds too Catholic to us, and so we are not going to celebrate Christmas. But that's such a narrow view because the word Christmas, that word mass, that part of it comes from the Latin Misa, which is the last part of the worship service, the dismissal. It basically means go. Now, that doesn't mean just get out of here. What it means is go in the sense of the Great Commission. Go now, and make disciples of every nation. Go! So when we see the word mass, it's about mission. And so when we see the word Christmas, we should see Christ's mission. And so this season, this Advent season, when we've talked about coming home for Christmas, when we put forth images that I hope are inviting to people and make people want to be present, to come home. We are coming home for Christ's mission, a mission that is summarized in the names and titles 
that are given, the acts of God's love that are about the work of saving and healing and restoring and liberating and delivering. Back when I was in high school, there was a group of us that when we get off work late at night, we wouldn't go home, we would go to this park that had a basketball court where the lights stayed on all night, and we play basketball. Now, we didn't go there just because of the lights, no. We went there because the rims were set at eight feet. It was a dunk fest for the vertically challenged. For those of us with limited leapability, if you get my drift, we loved going there and having a wonderful game of basketball where we could actually feel like we were tall. Well, we'd go there, like I said, after work. Well, I worked, and some of the guys I worked with worked at Long John Silver's. And so, you know, after we closed at midnight, we smelled pretty bad. And we'd go, and we'd play basketball, and it would even get worse. Well, one night when we were playing, I don't know, 12, 31 in the morning, out there dunking basketballs, having a great time, some guys showed up, and they asked if they could join us. And so we, I can't remember, had a four-on-four -four game or five-on-five. -five. We had a a great time and played for about 45 minutes and then we took a break and I remember sitting next to the car drinking a soda and one of the guys the new guys came over and he looks at me and he says what do they call you somebody wanted my name or nickname but before I could say anything my friend who knew me very well wanted to be funny and what he meant to say was oh we call him stinky which was appropriate for that day. But that's not what he said. He said, well, we call him Sticky. And before he could correct himself, Sticky stuck. <laughs> and I got the name, the title, the nickname Sticky. Not just that day. In intramural sports in high school, when they'd buy me a jersey, they'd put Sticky on the back. And so often, people would come up, they would see that name, they would laugh, and they'd say, oh, I bet there's a story behind that. But there really wasn't. Somebody just made a mistake. But before I could say that, my friends would always jump in and go, oh, yeah, there is quite the story. Someday he'll tell you, but it's just too long at this point. They continued to try to create this myth around it, and they spun it all the time to create it, something that really wasn't there at all. A word that was rather empty of meaning, and yet everybody assumed it had great meaning. It's funny to me, because Christmas is just the opposite. A word or a group of words that have great meaning, and yet they have been emptied of their meaning. Dead words that are used more and more and make us immune to the, the true meaning, make us immune to the living Christ, to Christ's mission, which is to heal and save and restore and liberate and deliver. So when someone says, Jesus is the reason for the season, or it's time to put the name back in the holiday, it's not just for nostalgia because words words have meaning and they carry with them an expectation and so when we say Christmas we're talking about Christ's mission which isn't just a statement but it, it's an expectation for us to become participants in Christ's mission which is to save and heal and restore and liberate and deliver. You pray with me? O giver of gifts, you have given us the greatest gift, Jesus, whose very name reveals how you are about the work of saving healing, restoring. This Jesus that you give is the Christ 
the anointed one who delivers and liberates. And so we prepare for Christmas, Lord. And we ask for your assistance so that we can be made ready to be a part of Christ's mission. The mission of saving and healing and restoring and delivering. You, Lord, are the architect, the prime mover of of these mission ideals. And yet you invite those of us who take the name of the child, who call ourselves followers of Jesus the Christ, to renew our commitment, especially during the Christmas season, to renew our commitment to the mission. For if we are going to put Christ back into Christmas, if we are going to help people understand that Jesus is the reason for the season, it's not just words, because the world has heard empty words. It's going to be through our actions inspired by you. Lord God, this morning we are mindful of those within our community in need of prayer, and we lift up Bob and and Ken, Chris, Helen, Eileen, Vicki, Gail. We pray for strength and grace, but we also pray, God, that you will work through us and that we can be that voice, that we can come alongside them, that we can bring alive Christ's mission for these individuals. Lord God, there are others in the life of our community who are hurting, people who are waiting for someone to heal, people who are feeling broken, or the relationships, or the family that they are a part of feels broken. And yet, God, you are the one who saves and heals and restores and liberates and delivers. And so, God, during this Christmas season, this season of Christ's mission, we pray that that we not only see you at work, but that we can come alongside you, that we can participate in all that you're doing. We ask all this in the name of that gift, born in a manger. Jesus the Christ. Amen.